Uh, good morning, everyone, and, and, uh, and welcome to the Atlantic Council. Um, I'm Fred Kemp. I'm President and CEO, and uh, I'm, I'm delighted to see uh, so many of you here today and also uh, as we stream for this timely discussion on why multilateral trade matters with the European Commission's Vice President, Jyrki Katainen. Why multilateral trade matters? That didn't sound like such a controversial title for a speech uh, uh, a few years ago, but indeed it is now. Vice President Katainen, welcome back to the Council. We're delighted to host you once again. Um, let me also uh, welcome all those joining us remotely via the live stream. If you would like to participate in today's discussion via Twitter, please use our hashtag, hashtag StrongerWithAllies. Um, this event is part of our Global Business and Economics Program's Euro Growth Initiative, which we uh, launched last year with Vice, Vice President Katain. I want to salute Mary, Marie Kasparik and, and the entire team of the Global Business and Economics Program for this initiative. I'll introduce Anders Aslan in a second. With this initiative, the Council aims to provide a blueprint on how to foster sustainable inclusive growth um, across Europe. In our view, uh, sustainable inclusive economic growth is the only way uh, to revive and strengthen confidence in the European system and, and stem the rise of populism, but not just in Europe. It's really a story across the world. And we saw uh, the Austrian elections over the weekend, uh, the 10 percent uh, outcome of the AFD in Germany. Uh, this is a story that's going to go on for some time uh, of populism uh, and very often driven by, by economic um, uh, frustrations. In addition, the initiative aims to underscore why a strong Europe, united Europe with robust economic growth, is vitally important to the United States and globally. Uh, just a few years ago, support for multilateral trade or multilateralism in general would not have qualified, as I said earlier, as a controversial topic. But since taking office, the Trump administration has removed the United States from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, withdrawn from the Paris Climate Agreement, and just last week revisited the nuclear uh, deal with Iran. And judging from the ongoing NAFTA talks, uh, this trade agreement, uh, can, uh, exit from this trade agreement uh, cannot be ruled out, but one, uh, we're still quite positive that this ne these negotiations could lead to a modernization and healthy outcomes on all sides, uh, but the time is short. Uh, at the same time, and you'll hear this from the Vice President, um, uh, the European Union, if I'm not mistaken, is engaged in some of the most robust set of trade negotiations uh, across the world. And I think that's not disconnected from what's going on in the United States, but I'll leave it to Vice President Katainen to, to fill us in on what's happening in these negotiations. Um, we're eager to hear uh, your remarks on why the EU and U.S. need the global multilateral system maybe now more than ever. Uh, Vice President Katainen serves as the European Commission Vice President for Jobs, Growth, Investment and Competitiveness. He joined the Commission in July 2014 as Vice President for Economic and Monetary Affairs in the Euro. Prior to that, he served as Prime Minister of Finland from 2011-2014 and Minister of Finance from 2007. Uh, to 2011. After he provides his keynote remarks, the Council's own inimitable Anders Asland uh, will moderate a conversation. Uh, so it's a one-two Nordic punch. Um, uh, Anders is a resident senior fellow in the Eurasia Center here at the Atlantic Council. He teaches at Georgetown University and is a leading specialist on economic policy in Europe and Russia. He's published widely and is author of 14 books. Uh, most recently with Simeon Jankov, uh, the Europe's Growth Challenge. Uh, so without further ado, Vice President Katain, the floor is yours. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for giving me a chance to discuss today on uh, bilateral, multilateral trade-related issues. It's a great honor to, for me to come back here to this, uh, to, to this very same venue where I was, was it a year ago. So I do appreciate this opportunity. So 
from the EU's point of view, it's very essential to maintain a global, open global system. We have seen in the past what happens if major economic economies adopt protectionist policies. When we, we then risk triggering a negative spiral like the one we saw at work in uh, the 1929 crisis. When one country closes its borders, others do the same, and we all become losers. This is especially true today at a time when our economies are even more interconnected and virtually all companies need to buy inputs or sell their products internationally. In a more protectionist world, we would all lose access to new products, services, technologies and ideas. Our companies would pay higher prices for inputs and, and lose clients in countries that close down. And the poorest citizens would be hit the hardest with price increases. That is what economists call a negative sum game, a situation in which results are negative for everybody. In, Euro in Europe, the phenomenon, phenomenon had disastrous economic consequences in the 1930s and contributed to social unrest and fueled nationalism and ultimately contributed to war. This is why after World War II, European countries decided to open up to each other and to create the largest world single market. This not only boosted EU's prosperity, economic growth and competitiveness, but it, this also created a long-lasting peace. It is now in our DNA to be open and trading with our neighbors, instead of going to war with them. What is true for Europe is true for the world. Open, rules-based and fair trade is a positive engine for prosperity, innovation and, and peace. And we all uh, can, uh, and we can all see this for ourselves. A more connected world has brought with it uh, new opportunities for many. People now travel, work, learn and live in different countries. They interact with each other on the web, sharing their ideas, cultures, and experiences. Students have online access to courses run by leading universities across the world. Countries can produce more for less by specializing in what they do best and exploiting economies of scale in global markets. International competition, global, uh, global climate action, scientific cooperation uh, and exchange of ideas have stimulated creativity and accelerated innovation. Companies active in international markets remain competitive because they uh, learn and adapt faster. This is what economists call a positive sum game, a situation where we all win by enlarging the buy rather than destroying a good part of it and fighting for what remains. Now, this being said, we are not naive free traders. It is also true that openness and competition are good only if they are fair and based on high standards. Trade must not only be open, but also rules-based and fair. This is why after Second World War, not only did we build the EU, but we also worked with the United States and other partners to build a stronger multilateral framework. We creating the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank uh, and the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which uh, later became the World Trade Organizations. These institutions and rules brought peace, stability, trust and prosperity for many. Interconnectedness increased and global trade shot up. In 2007-2008, G20 governments agreed to uphold this commitment to international cooperation when tackling the financial crisis that affected all of us. We collectively agreed to avoid repeating errors of the past and refrained from resorting to protectionism. We also coordinated to support the global economy and ad adapted more robust global rules to regulate financial market and fight tax, avoid tax avoidance. We then continued 
to develop a, the global rulebook by endorsing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in 2050, and then a binding international agreement to fight climate change in Paris. Today, more than ever, it is necessary to continue our global effort to cooperate on harnessing globalization. This is why it is important to preserve our, our multilateral world order and institutions. The WTO and its dispute settlement are amongst the most important elements of this system. They are not perfect, but provide for minimum rules and channels of cooperation that address trade relations and disputes. We hope we can count on all nations in the world and our US friends to preserve this crucial common good. The WTO and its dispute settlement are like the rules of the game and the referee in a football or a baseball match. If we get rid of them, this will get ugly and will rather look like a rollerball or hunger games. I don't think this is the kind of game we want to play. Beyond this, we must work together to improve global rule books and uh, economic governance to address loopholes. We need stronger discipline, for instance, on issues such as subsidies and state distortion that led, lead to overcapacity and dumping. Also, tax avoidance is one of those issues. Social and environmental standards. Work to develop the global rule book on these topics in the WTO or the G20 is essential. And so are bilateral cooperation or bilateral FTAs that contain modern rules. This is why the EU continues to negotiate modern new generation FTAs with around 20 partners around the globe. We are constantly looking for like-minded partners ready to open up, but also sign up to advanced rules and standards. We had just started to implement our trade agreement with Canada, politically concluded this year an FTA with Japan, and to hope to conclude soon with Vietnam, Singapore, and Mexico, as well as to start negotiation with Australia and uh, New Zealand. So basically, our working assumption is that we want to open up a new market in every six months. We are negotiating basically with all NAFTA countries and with all TPP countries except one. We believe in rules-based open fair trade. We, we want to let responsible, responsibly functioning market economy to solve our societal challenges such as unemployment climate change and poverty. We believe that rules-based trade strengthens the rules-based world order, which is fair. We believe that trade is the way to increase wealth, well-being, productivity, and competitiveness. Now, it is true that there are situations where certain partners are not willing to sign up to the same standards as us or do engage in unfair trade practices. We must then have the right tools to be able to restore a level playing field. But we must do so in full respect of WTO rules. In the EU, we are reforming our trade defense instruments and notably just agreed to use a new dumping calculation method close to the US one. These instruments are essential to protect EU industry from unfair competition. We have protected many jobs in the past years by, for instance, acting against dumping caused by oil capacity in steel sector in China. We also just proposed a new EU foreign investment screening framework, framework which will uh, allow us to react if foreign companies threaten our security or public order when taking over EU companies with critical technologies, infrastructure, inputs, or sensitive information. We must use these instruments whenever needed and are ready to cooperate with the United States and other partners to address the common challenges we face when trade is unfair and there is a need to restore level playing field. Our cooperation with Global Forum on Steel Excess Capacity is an example of such cooperation. Just to conclude, I would like to stress that EU-US bilateral relation remains essential for us even if TTIP negotiations are uh, halted. 
The U.S. is by far the EU's most important economic and political partner. In 2016, two-way trade in goods amounted to 1.67 billion per day. EU and U.S. investments are the real driver of the transatlantic relationship, contributing to growth and jobs on both sides of the Atlantic, with a third of the trade access to um, Atlantic actually consisting of intra-company intra transfers. The EU is committed to, to a strong transatlantic relationship and looks to establish a posi positive agenda for cooperation with the administration covering both bilateral and global issues. Thank you very much. TTIP is in freezer. Of course, we are ready to look at the opportunity in this front too, but um, if this continues to be like this, um, we could still look at opportunities uh, to, to cooperate in, in some sectoral areas. For instance, we could improve the regulatory cooperation. We could work in the fields of standardization and try to find the areas of common interest. So it doesn't need to be so that if we don't negotiate on TTIP, we don't do anything. From our perspective, it's, uh, it looks rather odd that we are negotiating close to 20 different countries or, or blocks on trade, li trade liberalization, but we wouldn't have anything to do with the United States. Uh, I mean, it cannot be like this. So. This one dimension, we have to um, build up a forward-looking agenda where we are addressing mm -hmm. trade barriers one by one. The second point or way to look at the cooperation opportunities is to work um, uh, under the umbrella of WTO, for instance, on overcapacity issue. China's overcapacity, steel overcapacity or aluminum overcapacity issue it's a, it's a challenge for both of us. It's a challenge for the whole world. And instead of taking unilateral um, actions on this issue, it would be better if we, if we cooperated, as we had done to a certain extent, even more in the future, and, and we could use uh, WTO as a platform to address those root causes. Because all capacity is something which you cannot address by by doing, uh, by imposing uh, tariffs or, or, or things like that, because all capacity is really deep disease of the economy. And that's why we have to cooperate uh, together, but also with the other, other economies and, and, of course, with China in order to address those root causes. And how do you think that this cooperation uh, should be organized if we take now the overcapacities of uh, steel and uh, aluminum in China? Should there be joint uh, US-EU uh, anti-dumping sanctions against China or should it be trilateral negotiations? Uh, what kind of uh, uh, pattern of setup do you see? Global Steel Forum is one, one uh, platform in, in which we can cooperate. And 
everybody understands that all capacity doesn't vanish overnight. And it has negative, I mean, if China want, as, as they have, at least they have said, they want to reduce the oil capacity, first of all, it will take some time. Second, it has some consequences to China itself. So we must understand that it's not easy to get rid of. But still, um, this is one way, uh, one, uh, one way to cooperate uh, w between the US, EU, and Japan, for instance. The second thing is that our trade defense <laughs> instruments are very similar in the US and, and <coughs> the EU. And, and, and also the, the calculation method, how to calculate dumping on unfair trading practices. Now, after we have changed our leg legislation, uh, our systems are very close to each other. So we could basically uh, defend our trade defense instruments and calculation method jointly when, uh, when mm -hmm. uh, there is a need for this. Yeah, I'll take a couple of more questions, but uh, then I'll open up for, uh, for the floor. So please uh, prepare your question and mark uh, whoever wants to uh, say something. But uh, I would like also to go on to the WTO. Uh, you mentioned how important it is that the WTO works, uh, and uh, it's not only rules-based, but it also enforces its rules um, uh, through uh, arbitration. And uh, there is now a concrete uh, problem that the United States has not uh, appointed uh, its members uh, to the appellate body, that is the arbitration court of the WTO. Uh, is this an issue on your agenda here in Washington? It is, because, um, I, I mean, there's ver very little what EU can do on this. My message is very simple, that we hope that US would, would stop blocking the, the nomination, because we need dispute settlement body, which is well-functioning and which is operational. So um, even if you may think that WTO is sometimes slow or it's not perfect, but it's existing multilateral way to address uh, uh, the issues and, and uh, settle the dispute. Uh, or dis it's a well-organized uh, dispute settlement organization, which we have, a global one. So, so there's nothing to win by blocking the nomination. And you hope to get that done? I, I do hope because uh, this is what we believe is the best way to address all these challenges which we both face. Yeah, uh, Fred Kemp here just uh, pointed out to me that uh, your speech right now, it sounds very much as the, the European Union is taking the lead in uh, global uh, trade and uh, the EU is the biggest economy in the world today, uh, slightly bigger than the US and it's uh, the biggest uh, a single market uh, in the world, and you are uh, pushing it. Is this good for the European Union that you are becoming the, the le uh, leader? And how do you see this uh, for the EU uh, as such in the future? Yeah, like Fred said in the beginning, that multilateralism has been non-issue for for many years. It's um, it has not been a controversial issue. Same things. Same thing with uh, trade. Trade has not been a political issue, at least in Europe, for, for decades. Nobody was interested in, in trade policy as such. It became an issue a few years ago. There were more organizations and people who were opposing world trade. But now, out of the sudden, I would say eight, nine months ago, things started to change. So um, our phone started to rang very actively, many countries outside from Europe called to us and can we, can we uh, proceed faster in our trade negotiations? Can we uh, kick, uh, start new negotiations? As I said, we are negotiating with, we, we already concluded negotiation with Canada and, and we hope to conclude the modernization negotiations or FTA with uh, Mexico sometimes beginning of the year. In Asian countries, we, we, we have a political agreement with Japan on FDA, very comprehensive one, very good one. So um, the reason for this is that many countries want to oppose protectionism and they want to strengthen multilateralism. And 
And there's a political need to explain to our citizens what trade basically means. And tra free trade, for instance, I have changed in my personal vocabulary free trade by using rules-based trade. Because free trade, for some, means trade without or free of uh, rules. Even though the truth is the contrary. If you look at CEDAS agreement, <coughs> EU, Canada, trade agreement, 1,000 pages thick agreement, full of rules. Trade will be almost completely free of uh, duties, but, uh, but uh, full of rules. So this is the way we believe we can bring social and environmental values amongst the other others to the global trade. So it is not only about economic issue, but it's also highly political issue, where we can bring sustainable values to global trade. So if I draw that a bit further, the EU are now setting the international standards through big bilateral trade agreements. Why the, uh, why the, e, uh, the US is withdrawing? Does this mean that the EU is benefiting from the EU uh, from the US reluctance in trade? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> sorry uh, for but putting the point. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I mean, this is what happens. It's, it's true, but uh, it doesn't mean that we want to benefit at the expense of the United States. As I said, we are, we are ready to, to cooperate. We want to cooperate with the United States because we share the values. And nothing <coughs> which has been valuable for uh, transatlantic uh, trans relations for decades has not disappeared anywhere. So one of the strongest narrative which we have when we still were negotiating on TTIP was that, that it, it should be good and strong incentive for everybody if we have, if US and the Europe could have a power to set standards for global trade from the same value basis. So now we are doing it a little bit um, differently than, than we, we thought with, with other countries, but uh, we really want to, to encourage US to become back to the to the, this kind of. Thank you for a very clear message. With that, I open up uh, the floor to Ngin Choi. And please introduce yourself with uh, uh, name and the institution. Yes, and and use the mics, yeah. Good morning, Sanjin Choi Langham Partners. Mr. Minister, welcome. And then how splendid and fun and bank organized the annual meeting around your birthday. Ah, we had a very good one. <laughs> <laughs> My question is with regard to the, your meeting with Mr. Ross. Uh, Secretary Ross believed a uh, trade deficit as net negative income, which is not good things. How were you able to cope with it? Because this administration viewed trade as transactional, not necessarily institutional based. The second question is um, looking at the fund World Economic Reform Report. And of course, the economic growth, gro global growth is upward trajectory. However, they're concerned in mid term, the increase in uh, protectionism and especially advanced economy which can exacerbate a capital outflow from emerging market. You know, at the end of the day, emerging market account for 50% of global GDP. Uh, it would be interesting in your views. And one remark about Anderson, your um, comment on cement. I believe Governor Zhu from People's Bank of China was here last week. I believe I heard what he was commenting. Chinese government is uh, intent to voluntarily reduce steel and cement production by 10% next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, just counting or calculating trade deficits or surplus doesn't give a real picture of the impact of trade. So this is our understanding. Sometimes EU has trade surplus or trade deficit with some com partner, but um, it's not the whole truth. Even, I mean, it becomes even more difficult to assess the the real deficit or, or a surplus in current world where value chains go across the border. For instance, iPhone, uh, to which country's balance sheet the export of iPhone should be counted? <coughs> sometimes the Chinese balance sheet or sometimes US, something, I mean, uh, or, or US manufactured BMW. So the value chains are going cross-border 
and and if you only count the, the value of the, the end product, you cannot get a, get a clear picture. So that's why th there's a point to look at deficits and, and uh, surpluses if you want to assess how competitive your own economy is. But it doesn't tell the whole uh, truth of uh, trade value chains and what trade means to, to individual countries. Growth in midterm. Um, I had a chance to visit, visit IMF just, uh, just yesterday. And um, their assessment seems to be quite optimistic cautiously optimistic, so two issues uh, which could be taken into account is that um, now it's a perfect time to do structural reforms. Even though being in politics I know that uh, in good economic times it's almost impossible to reform your country. Crisis is much better time but it's much worse in terms of impact of uh, reforms. <coughs> and, and here I pinpoint uh, our member states, EU, EU member states, we have to put pressure on on member states to continue to reform the societies in order to be prepared for for next downturn. Uh, but unfortunately, political risks have become to the scene, and and if I should mention one potential risk for the growth, uh, instead of uh, mentioning financial stability, I, I would mention political risks in different parts of the world. So, so protectionism is one of those consequences of, uh, of political risk. So we can destroy well-studied growth by, by politics, but there is no, no much point to do so. Mm. Finally, China. I know that China, is, uh, China has recognized its overcapacity problem. The country has done something on the issue, but at the same time they have improved. For instance, when talking about steel, they have improved the productivity of certain uh, plants, which has actually increased uh, steel production instead of reducing. So there's, it's, it's perfectly ac acceptable and positive that the productivity is raising. But at the same time, the oil capacity remains there, or it's getting even larger. So the challenge is becoming bigger. And, and that is the reason why we should cooperate together with the United States and Japan, but also with China, in order to, to help them to address the oil capacity. Other questions? Please. Hmm. Justin Margolis, the government of Quebec. Um, so I'm actually thinking about Wallonia and the CETA. Uh, given the more players that go into an agreement and the more chance that one region or state can block, how do you address those challenges? Um, our trade agreement with uh, Singapore went through the European Code of Justice. <laughs> and the European Code of Justice ruling was very clarifying. They said that, let's say, 98% of normal trade issues falls under the EU competence, meaning that we call it EU only agreement is possible, be, meaning that qualified majority voting uh, is, uh, is possible in the future trade agreements. Investment related issues, including portfolio investments, um, will still remain uh, in unanimous decision making. So depending on the will of the member states, uh, we can separate uh, the, the agreements to two. So first covers most of the trade issues and then investment, including investment uh, protection issues could be separated from, from trade agreement. By the way, um, EU's aim is to create a multilateral uh, investment dispute settlement uh, body or, or a core instead of using ISDS system. So this is our political aim. We are pushing this initiative uh, forward everywhere because we believe that it would be much better than bilater bilateral arrangements and it would, uh, it would be seen more fair and, and sustainable solution.
Thank you, that's an important point. And the question over here. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, Brian Bradley from International Trade today. Um, are you taking any efforts to sort of restart TTIP negotiations? And if so, what are those? Um, and as well, um, when you observe some of the things ongoing in the NAFTA negotiation, such as um, a proposal for a U.S. domestic content requirement, um, does it concern you that um, if adopted, those provisions could serve to um, upend some traditional principles of international trade of you know, progressive liberalization and, and uh, equitable liberalization across FTA parties? Thanks. We have understood that TTIP is not on the agenda of uh, current uh, administration. If there were a political will to, to consider a potential continuation of the, of the negotiations, uh, it would mean that we, we, of course, should have some sort of prior talks, whether there's a political appetite and a political ownership to, to get somewhere with the negotiations. So, if, from our point of view, TTIP is in freezer at the moment, but if there, if there was a political will to restart, uh, we are open for, for this idea. But we, we, don't, we are not dreaming on, on anything. So that's why one of the options could be to explore sectoral uh, opportunities, sectoral problems which we could address by, by having regulatory cooperation. For instance, in car sector, in cosmetics, in medical devices, etc. Uh, it, it does not replace the comprehensive trade an investment agreement at all, but uh, it's um, just a way to improve business environment. And uh, as I said before, uh, for us it, it, it looks a bit odd if the, once the world is developing and the market is evolving, if US and the EU wouldn't like to do anything in order to create better business environment. Yeah. And, and your uh, NAFTA, uh, another question, Yes, we are concerned of potential outcome of NAFTA, but um, it has been quite difficult to follow because the messages are quite controversial. So we don't have a clear picture of the potential landing zone at the moment. Many European companies have invested to NAFTA area significantly because of uh, because of a free trade agreement in North Northern Africa, uh, no, Northern America, and and. And, and and that that is one of the reasons why we are following very carefully what is the future of NAFTA because it may have some impact to to European European industry also. So we have concerns, but uh, concerns, but um, it's not that well specified yet because um, uh, negotiations have not proceeded that that fast. At least this is our impression. So we can end up with the odd situation that the European Union has a free trade agreements with Canada and Mexico, while the, the US would only have WTO conditions if it stays in the WTO, of course. Yeah. So, <coughs> but uh, let me give you one final question that uh, you have not mentioned the uh, Eastern free trade agreements that uh, the European Union has with Ukraine, Moldova and uh, Georgia. Uh, in particular, the one for Ukraine has a lot of import quotas in it. Do you see possibilities of promoting and expanding uh, this trade or rather how? The trade agreement with Ukraine has had many positive impacts. It has helped Ukraine to reform their society. And of course, the trade itself is valuable. But, um, but also, the the political consequences of uh, trade agreement has been significant. So we concentrate together with other inter international institutions to support Ukraine to modernize the economy, the structure, structure of the economy in order to become more competitive also in, in the world trade. So um, we are open for future options, but at the moment the, co the focus is uh, to support 
Ukraine financially and uh, and help them to do reforms for the for the structures of the national economy. Thank you very much, Vice President Kaitan, and you have given us a lot of substance in very few minutes here. Thank, Thank you, you and the, wishing you the best of luck here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm Thanks glad so much. you talked mm -hmm. about the um, 